Well, good morning, Hope East Village. It's good to, good to see you, good to be with you. Uh, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, my name is Drew, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Hope. And I just want to say uh, on behalf of our community that we are so glad that you're here and that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. We have been in a long series in the book of James, um, and we're, we're nearing the end. We're close. I think, we, I think we are in week 11, week 11. So we got one more week. Next week's the last sermon in James, and then we'll be transitioning to something else. But um, yeah, it's been, as Chelsea said, it's been a really rich series, a really, uh, James has been speaking to us a lot about, you know, a lot of different things, namely about um, what it means for us to put our faith into practice, right? We call this series Faith in Action because James is really concerned about how faith puts flesh on in the world. He, he doesn't spend a lot of time kind of talking about our doctrinal beliefs and our theology in some abstract way because James is, is concerned about how that comes down and touches the ground. Like, how does that show up in love for our neighbors? To put it in James's words, faith without works is dead. So don't talk to me about about how deep your faith is if it doesn't show up in justice and mercy for your neighbors. So James sort of reiterates that over and over and over again. And so this week as we continue in this series in week 11, um, and we look at verses 7 through 11, I want to talk to you this morning from the title, Patient Endurance. Patient Endurance. Will you pray with me? God, we are so, so grateful to be here this morning. We're grateful to be here because we know that you are here with us. You are here, as we even were singing about earlier, you are here, you are working in our midst. We've come, we've gathered together to worship you, to worship your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to do this. And Lord, um, I, I know that so many of us are coming in here with so many different things on our hearts and minds, so many different things that we're carrying. Some of us come in just experiencing the heights of joy. Some of us are feeling the depths of sorrow. Others of us are somewhere in between. Lord, but wherever we're at, would you meet us and minister to our hearts? Lord, we don't want to go through just another Sunday, kind of doing the doing the Sunday thing, going through the Sunday routine, but we, we, need, to, we need to hear from you. We need to have a, an encounter with you, the true and living God. We need to see you. And so like Moses, we, we ask audaciously that you would show us your glory. Give us a glimpse of your face. Allow us to see a little bit more deeply into your character because we need to know you. But, Lord, we thank you that you know us and that you love us deeply. And so, Lord, I pray that I wouldn't be a distraction to the things that you would want to do and say this morning. So, Lord, would you move me out of the way, hide me behind your cross, Jesus, so that you might be all in all. And to that end, Lord, I ask that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer in whom we trust. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you were here last week, you know that, that James kind of came at us real hard last week, right? So in the first six verses of chapter 5, James had some heavy things to say. And not only was the content of it heavy, but uh, when he was talking about the judgment that is coming to the rich because of the oppression that they carry out in this world. But James was also fierce with the tone that he was speaking in. I mean, the first six verses of chapter 5 are like John the Baptist in the wilderness kind of tone, right? James says, come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. That's how chapter 5 starts. But then all of a sudden, we get to verse 7, James switches his tone. He switches his tone from the prophet to the pastor. And in his tone, it switches because his audience switches. 
In the first six verses, he's talking to those rich oppressors who's, who are carrying out this oppression against the communities that he's speaking to. But he's got no sweet tone for them. But when we get to verse 7, James starts to talk again to the beloved community. This community of Christ followers who had experienced so much suffering and so much oppression. This community that he's been encouraging to continue steadfast in the way of Jesus in the midst of the fiery trial that has been coming their way. Remember, chapter 1, James starts out the letter, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you are facing trials of various kinds, knowing that the trial of your faith produces endurance. And so James is speaking to them reminding them to be patient. And so last week, the shepherd spoke with a harsh tone to try and keep the wolves away from the flock. And this week, the shepherd turns his gaze toward the sheep and speaks with tenderness. And James says, be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. And before we begin to dive into this, I, I just want to pause on this word, beloved. See, James has had a lot of hard things to say to us over these past several weeks. A lot of challenging words that have come our way. But everything that we've been hearing, every prophetic exhortation that we've been given, is meant to be heard in the context of our belovedness. One thing that I take seriously as a parent is that I never want to assume that my daughters know that I love them. I don't want to make that assumption, right? And so I, I hope that they know. It's my hope that they know that, but I want to be intentional about communicating it to them over and over and over, both through action and also through verbalizing it to them. And so sometimes I'll, I'll stop them during the day. We'll be kind of doing whatever, and I'll stop them during the day, and I'll look at them, and I'll say, guess what? Guess what? And it's gotten to the point where they, they look at me and they go, Daddy, we know. <laughs> we know. You love us. Right? I love to hear that. It's, I love to hear that. But this was something that I got from my parents. My mom, my mom, like, I, I, would, I would often hear her, like, she would come up to me and she would say, hey, hey, Drew, have I told you that I love you today? Right? She would always ask me that question. And it's something that has always stuck with me. And I bring this up. I bring this up to say that just like as a parent, I don't want to assume that my daughters know that I love them. As your pastor, I don't want to assume that you know that God loves you. I don't want to assume that. I realize that there are a million different reasons in this world and a million different reasons in your own life that would make you question that about yourself, that would cause you to have valid questions as to whether God actually loves you. Maybe it's something that somebody has said to you or communicated it to you. Maybe it's that internal voice that is telling you over and over again, God can't possibly love me. Look at all the stuff that I've done. I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. I'm this, I'm that. And that you constantly are telling yourself that over and over again. I, I, I get that. And so part of my job as your pastor is to over-communicate to you that you are loved by God. To over-communicate it to you that you are loved by God. That you are a beloved son or daughter of God with whom God is well-pleased. We can't hear that enough. We cannot hear that enough. Because there's always things that are trying to steal that away from 
And I want to communicate to you that your belovedness, your belovedness has nothing to do with your behavior. It's not about that. But it has everything to do with the fact that you and I have been adopted into the family of God because of the finished work of Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And so there's nothing that you or I could do to make God love us more or love us less. Our status, our identity is beloved. That's just who we are. And there's nothing that's changing that. Like, I could stop the sermon right now and just say, that's good news. We could go home. We don't don't even need to hear anything more than that. See, when it comes to God, belovedness is not earned. It is freely given. It is freely given. And that's probably one of the hardest truths for us to receive because we live in a culture that teaches us we need to earn everything. We have to earn everything, but it's not that way in God's economy. And God knows that we are actually enabled to love others, to love our neighbors, and to seek justice and correct oppression when we have been and are being transformed by love. See, this is why some of Jesus' last words to his disciples, before they would engage in the work of the kingdom of God after Jesus would be crucified and resurrected and ascended, Jesus said to them in John chapter 15, hey, I just want you to abide in my love. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. Make your home there. I'm not asking you to earn it, but I'm just asking you to stay put there. Stay put in the love that is constantly being poured out on you. Because there's nothing more transforming than for us to know that we are loved. And so James, he switches tone. He says, beloved, and he says it several times in the span of four verses because he wants them to know how loved they are. He wants them to know their identity. He says to the beloved community, be patient. He says, be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. Now, remember, these communities have been going through a lot. They've namely been facing a lot of economic oppression. And I have to tell you, to be honest, that I, and I'm saying this from the context of history, that telling oppressed communities to be patient has been a tool used to keep oppression going. I think of Dr. Martin Luther King's words that he wrote in his now famous letter from a Birmingham jail, in which he wrote to white clergy who didn't want black folks to show up in Birmingham to protest and instead kept telling them to be patient, be patient, be patient. And Dr. King says this. He says, for years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see that justice too long delayed is justice denied. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over. And men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. As I got to be honest, when I first began to sit with James's words here, it, it was hard for me because of how the exhortation to be patient has been used in the face of injustice. And see, when James says, be patient for the coming of the Lord, he he certainly has the second coming of Christ in distant view. See, one of the core confessions of the church is that Christ will return to make all things new. Well, we make this confession every time we take communion, when we say together, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Right? And this confession is part of the bedrock of Christian hope because it lets us know that the story is not yet over. That that the story that God is writing is not done. That the oppression and the injustice and the lovelessness that we face and that we see in this world will not have the last word. 
And we don't know what that's going to look like, and we don't know when the second coming of Christ is going to happen, but the church has always maintained that it will. And that we as the church are to live in light of that reality. Right? That's why Jesus is always exhorting, be ready, stay ready, stay ready, stay ready. Right? You, you, you don't know the day or the hour. You don't know when God's going to show up. So James believes that to be true, and every one of the early New Testament writers, they, they believed this to be true, and they, they sort of lived with this imminence of it. They didn't know when it was going to happen. They were like, it could happen tomorrow. And so James believes that to be true, and he also believes that when that happens, injustice and oppression will once and for all come to an end. But I believe that here in this text, when James talks about the coming of the Lord, he's, he's also got something else in view. And so as I sat with this text, it started to make sense to me what he was doing. And the clue to unlocking what he's saying with the exhortation toward patience and waiting for the coming of the Lord is actually found back in chapter 4, or back in verse 4 of chapter 5. And so we know that James is not telling them to just do nothing and be silent. Like, James literally just got finished railing against the rich oppressors. And so rem remember, James says to, uh, he says in, back in verse 4, he says, Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. See, I purposely didn't talk about this last week, but one of the things that James is doing here is he's drawing on the imagery of the Exodus story. When God acted within history to liberate the Hebrew people from enslavement in Egypt. So I, I want you to listen to these verses from Exodus 2 and 3 and see if you can hear the similarities. Exodus 2, verses 23 through 25. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. God took notice. And then in Exodus chapter 3, God is speaking to Moses here, and God says, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. See how similar the language is? The cries of the oppressed reaching the ears of the Lord and God responding. And See, this story of the Exodus is a story that formed the foundation of Israel as a people. And so when James, speaking to these Jewish communities of Christ followers, starts talking about the cries of the oppressed reaching the ears of the Lord, this story is what would have been called to mind for them. They would have, have immediately been thinking about Exodus. And see, in the biblical tradition, when God hears the cries of the oppressed, it means that God is getting ready to show up and act on their behalf. And we know how God did this in the Exodus story. God raised up Moses and directed him to confront Pharaoh with those words, let my people go. And through signs and wonders, God put pressure on Pharaoh until Pharaoh relented and let the people go free. But there's also another part of this story that is important to James. See, before God called Moses and sent him to Pharaoh... Moses had already gotten fed up with what was going on in Egypt. And when Moses saw one of his brothers being tortured by an Egyptian, he took matters into his own hands and he killed an Egyptian. 
right? This is actually what caused him to flee into the wilderness where he had his encounter with God at the burning bush. And so what James is doing here by recalling this entire story is he's saying, be patient because God has heard your cries and God is going to come and act on your behalf. Set your minds on the character of God. The same God who heard the cries of our ancestors and responded is the same God who is hearing your cries right now. So don't get downcast and think that God has abandoned us. But don't take matters into your own hands like Moses did. But instead, wait for the voice of God. Wait for the direction of God. Wait for the wisdom of God. See, we will always be tempted to go about taking situations into our own hands in order to achieve the ends we want in the way we want to do it and in the time we want it done. Right? That will always be a temptation of ours. One of the temptations that comes to every follower of Jesus is to try to force God's will to be done to try and force God's will to be done. But this is why Jesus taught us as his disciples to constantly pray, your will be done, your will be done. See, when we pray that we are praying, God, your will be done and do it in your way and do it in your time. See, during Jesus' day, there were a lot of people who were interested in what Jesus was up to and interested in following him who were part of a a group of people known as the Zealots. And when I use the term Zealot, I'm talking about a group of people who wanted to bring an end to the oppression that the people were facing, and they were willing to do it through use of violent means. They, 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 They had this sort of, by any means necessary, we will take down the oppressor. That's what we're gonna do. And see, when you read through the Gospels, one thing you will never hear is Jesus critiquing the zealots for their desire to see oppression and injustice come to an end. Because that is in line with the will of God. God hates injustice. God hates oppression. God is committed to seeing that come to an end. We know that to be true. But what you will hear is Jesus critiquing their way of going about it. For example, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and the Roman soldiers come to unlawfully arrest him and Peter takes out his sword and cuts off the ear of the Roman soldier, Malchus, cuts it off. He, he's going to defend his Lord. He is, he, and Peter, Peter was sort of formed in that zealotry sort of thing. Peter Peter would have been ready to take up arms immediately if Jesus said, let's go. He would have, that's why, I mean, Peter stayed strapped, right? He carried a sword with him. And so Peter was ready. And he would have cut, he cut off the, the ear of the Roman soldier. And so when that happened, what did Jesus do? Jesus reached down, picked up this man's ear, and he healed him. He healed him. And then he turns to Peter. And he says, Peter, put away your sword. Because if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Because Jesus knew that this sort of violence that is trying to, take, trying to achieve what it wants is only just going to be a cycle that repeats itself over and over and over again. Because, yes, you may achieve something through violence, but then it's just going to come right back. It's just going to come right back. And somebody's going to respond in violence to you. And then you're going to have to respond in violence, and it just keeps going. That has been the story of history. And so Jesus says, put away your sword, Peter. And throughout church history, this, the church has said when, when Jesus told Peter to put away his sword, he said that to every disciple of Jesus who would follow. That, that we as disciples of Jesus don't go about achieving the kingdom of God through a sword or through the barrel of a gun. We don't do that. It's not the way of Jesus. It's not the way of the kingdom. See, when James is 
exhorting these communities toward patient endurance in the midst of their suffering. He's wanting them to remain faithful to the way of Jesus and not to get swept up in trying to take matters into their own hands, accomplishing God's ends their own way. Even though the use of violence was probably alluring to them. And there were certainly voices who were urging them to go in that direction. See, for us, the temptation might be different. Although some of us in here might be tempted to choose violence. But the larger point is that we need to pay attention to the ways we are tempted to take matters into our own hands when we feel like God is taking too long. That's the larger point. How are we being tempted to take matters into our own hands when we feel like, God, where you at? You're taking too long. This situation, this fiery trial that I'm in, I don't like how it's going. And I don't see you around. I don't see you in the furnace with me. So, God, I, I got to do something. I got to handle this my own way. And so the question we're being invited to live in is, how do we learn to hear the voice of God? and discern the direction of God in the midst of the fiery trials that come at us? How, how do we learn to listen and discern the voice of God when all of this stuff is swirling and it's pressing in on us and we are being tempted to, to change our situation by any means necessary? So James gives us two examples of what he has in mind when he calls us to patient endurance. He says in verse 10, he says, as an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who showed endurance. See, this right here is how we know that James is not saying sit back and do nothing in the face of injustice. He says, I want you to patiently endure like the prophets did. Like this the prophets, the prophets they, they spoke out when the poor were being taken advantage of, when, when laborers' wages were being withheld, when people were being trampled on and dishonored, and, and, and they suffered because of it. They suffered because of it. Right? They, they were thrown in jail. They were beaten. They were killed. That is the history of what it means to be a prophet. But see, in the midst of their suffering, they did not draw back from the way of God. They didn't draw back, but they remained faithful to it. And in so doing, they bore witness to God's new world that is coming. So their lives were this constant witness of who God is and what God is doing and will do. And when things got hard for them and when people wouldn't listen to them and people turned against them, they didn't just resort to saying, okay, let's just take up the sword or let's just do things this way or let's just go with this idol because it looks like it's better over here, right? Like they didn't do that. They remained faithful to Yahweh. They said, no, no, come this way. This, this, is, this is the way of life. This is the way of life. And they're constantly inviting people back. James then brings up Job. And see, Job's suffering was different than the suffering of the prophets. Job experienced the suffering that comes with being human. Sickness, death, loss. If you know the story of Job, you know that Job lost everything. His family his friends, his, his wealth, his, all of it. And there was this conversation that was happening between Satan and, and God, this sort of thing where Satan came to God and was like, listen, you have pro protected Job far too much. You protected him. That's why he is so righteous, and that's why he praises you and worships you. But let some stuff happen to Job. And see how quickly he changes his tune. That's basically how the conversation went. And God said, listen, and there's so much depth and complexity and sort of uncertainty here as to how, how, how this 
how this all, like how we relate to suffering and what's going on in the midst of suffering and where's God in our suffering and all of that. But we know that God said, listen, all these things can happen to Job. Don't touch his life. You can't take his life. And so one by one by one, stuff starts to happen to Job. And the voices that were around Job at the time that were witnessing everything that was going on for him and all the suffering that he was going through were telling him, you need to just abandon God altogether. Like, like, like why are you still calling out to God? His own wife said, you just need to curse God and die. Just, just throw up your hands and give it up. But we know that even though Job, there's this sort of up and down trying to, trying to struggle and trying to make sense of it all. We know that the, the witness of Job's life and sort of the place that he began to occupy within uh, the Jewish story was that Job was this picture of someone who, who, who remained faithful in the face of suffering, who didn't draw back from God, who, who stayed the course of walking in righteousness. And so that's why James brings him up here, just to say, look, we, we, we know the story of Job. We know what happened with Job. And we know that in the end of Job's story, God brought about vindication for Job. See, this one could argue is the entire point of James's letter. That in the midst of the fiery trial and suffering that comes our way, Patient endurance looks like remaining faithful to the way of Jesus. And we don't patiently endure because we have the strength to do it in and of ourselves. But what enables us to patiently endure is keeping our eyes fixed on the character of God. In the midst of the trial, keeping our eyes fixed on who God is. James goes on to say, you have heard of the endurance of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. See, that word purpose in the Greek is the word telos. Telos is a super important word in the New Testament. It it means the end or the goal of something. It's the destination toward which something is moving. And James says that the telos of the Lord is compassion and mercy. In other words, this is where God always ends up. This is where God is always taking things. This is how God will ultimately show up for God's people, compassion and mercy. And the reason that this is God's telos is because this is God's character. In Exodus 34, 6, when God revealed God's name to Moses, it says this, the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. This is who God has always been. This is who God has always shown God's self to be. And this is who God will always be. When everything is crashing in on us, we can count on the character of God. When we don't have all the answers, church, we can count on the character of God. When when, when injustice raises its head once again, we can count on the character of God. See, the greatest news in all the world is that God will always be faithful to God's own self. Meaning that God will always be who God said God would be. That is good news. It is good news. See, and and we know that because that's who God is, what God will ultimately do is what God said God would do. God is going to show up. God is going to act. God is going to raise people up. God is going to restore things. This is who God is. And it might not happen in the way we want it to happen. And it might not want it to happen in the time that we think it should happen. But but the encouragement of the scriptures is that God has not abandoned us. That God is still committed to us. So, So be patient and keep your eyes fixed on the Lord. Let who God is form then how we show up in the world as those who are made in the image of this compassionate and merciful God. 
as those who are called to reflect this God out into the world. Patient endurance doesn't just look like sitting back and doing nothing. It looks like remaining faithful to being image bearers of God, reflecting the character and the love and the mercy and the justice of God into the world and not drawing back and saying, we're going to do things our own way. We'll take things into our own hands. And so it's in light of who God is, beloved, that we patiently endure.